what another day. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to set up. We had everything perfectly working last night, yeah. testing out the new software and whatnot, but my audio and video are not matching up. The video's a little laggy. Um, it's like 60 frames per second that's going into it, but it's only capturing at 30 or vice versa. I don't know. But our guest has been waiting there for like 20 minutes. It's like, so long as you can hear me and see me a little bit, I mean, if I have to, I'll just post a profile picture <laughs> of me just sitting there just like, <laughs> yeah. Everything's going great. <laughs> yeah, it's a podcast anyways, but a lot of people enjoy uh, the visual aspect of it. Bass said our guest today is pretty, it's pretty, in it. it's a pretty interesting uh, guest because he's my friend, but... We don't talk a lot, so I have we'll probably have a lot to talk about. I'm going to give him a brief introduction for those that don't know, and then I'll let him elaborate, so to speak. This is a gentleman that used to work there and still does a little bit for National Geographic, bringing his talents to the aquarium hobby, which is, has been absolutely fascinating to watch his his growth on YouTube. He's almost at 100,000 subscribers, currently at 92,000. Absolutely insane to see that. Accumulating nine and a half million views. Insane. He only started Crazy. making videos back in, uh, he started uploading in November of uh, 2017. Oh, wow. So, not a long time YouTube creator, but uh, he's certainly getting well established. We'll bring him in now. Alex Wenchel of Tank Tested. Welcome to Welcome. Aquariums Unfiltered. You're going to have a conversation with Tamara and I. For all of our fellow tank mates, how do you like the name of uh, the chant of the podcast? I like it a I lot. It? Yeah, I mean, cool, yeah. I I don't know what I would have come up with. Uh, actually, I do. I briefly did a like live stream at the start of COVID that I think I called Aquariums with Strangers. I think you probably oh. have a better name. Just gonna be yeah, honest. Not for me. Um, I was, uh, you know, I'll, this guest coming on, but I'll just tell the story. Uh, I was mentioning about podcasting to a, a friend of mine. We were, we were both loaded FaceTime each other, and, I, and we came up with the name Aquariums Unfiltered. And then uh, two months later, when I was creating the website, I was like, what was the name that I thought of? And I brought this up, and then he's like, bro, that I, I came up with that name or something like that. I don't remember. It. He, he's like, you don't remember anything, but he'll be on as a guest eventually. I thought, I thought Aquariums Unfiltered was perfect because I don't... You know, I like to talk to aquarium hobbyists, but when we meet in person, we rarely actually talk about fish and stuff. But the conversations are fantastic and yeah. they're educational and behind yeah. the scenes. And but I'm going to give you a chance to introduce yourself there, Alex. Just yeah. a little ba background on yourself. I'll, I'll give a little background on me, but just yeah. uh, tag on to what you just said. I think as someone that I watch, uh, I used to watch a lot more YouTube. I watch a lot of your stuff. Like, what am I going to get from talking to you about aquariums? I've kind of heard you say everything yep. about aquariums over the last decade. Mm -hmm. But uh, my my background, as Joey said, you know, my name is Alex Winchell. I'm a documentary producer by trade. Um, and, you know, for the last decade, I've pretty much exclusively worked with Nat Geo, which is a really, really cool gig. But mm -hmm. I also am an aquarist by hobby, uh, specifically aquascaping. And I have been keeping fish since I was six years old. I started with live bearers, um, and I had a pair of live bearers, and then I had a bunch of live bearers. Uh, so I learned about that when I was like six years old. And then I, at around 10, I got African cichlids. Around 12, I got discus fish. And then when I got into high school, I did saltwater. And I did saltwater for like four years. Every dollar I made walking dogs went into my aquarium hobby. Uh, and now I definitely won't ever do saltwater again because it is just too expensive for me. Um, went off to college, majored in environmental preservation, which kind of gives you an insight of who I am as a person. Right. And uh, then came back in the midst of the Great Recession, took about a year and a half to get a stable job that allowed me to buy aquariums again. Very quickly got a 75 gallon. And since then, I've had aquariums every, every day of the last 10 years. Um, I've gone from one aquarium to 14 aquariums in my apartment, and I've lived here my whole, my whole adult life. So it's basically just been this this apartment filled to the brim with aquariums. That's my background. I'm saying that you you know your entire what what you've been keeping. How long? How old are you? I'm 32. Oh, okay. So because it's 26 years. Just, yeah, the the way you're, yeah, it had to have been quite a few years because the way you're describing it, you should be like I don't know, seventy eight. <laughs> <laughs> I kept this for seven years and then this for two, and I'm trying to do the math in my head, and I know I'm not that smart, but I knew that we were getting past twenty years. I was like, okay, <laughs> Alex, how old are you? Like the fountain of youth over there. <laughs> Meanwhile, yeah, no. I'm pushing forty. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm what I'm six years younger than you, something like that. 
Rub it not, in. That's not, cool. not to out you very specifically. <laughs> so that's what we're gonna do today. You, you know, you know, uh, rub, rub it in. Look, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna will... die first. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I've been keeping fish for a long time, um, but not to the extent that so many other people in this hobby do, where they internalize every fact about the fish in their in their brains. Mm. I am a generalist, and I've always approached from the perspective of if I can keep it on paper, I don't need to yep. keep it in my brain. So mm -hmm. when I hear Aquarius just name dropping species left and right and the, the Latin names of them, I'm like, I don't have any of that in my head. I don't know any well, of that information. Well, neither do I. I mean, I think it's, I think a lot of it is um, smoke and mirrors. Yeah. <laughs> what, you were just Googling that? Is that what you did? Because I got to do that every once in a while. If I don't know the Latin name, I know the Latin name of all my favorite fish, but I mm -hmm. can't do it with every fish. So yeah. I a lot of Googling behind the scenes. You have to remember, people are like highly edited at the same time, but. Yes, um, <laughs> absolutely. The people that can list off Latin names, no problem, are fish store owners because they look at lists yeah. all day long. That's yeah. all they see. So it's easy to, but, and it makes them sound misleadingly intelligent. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> so, but, you know, um, but using common names also is, uh, just a sec here. Yeah, using common names is also can be misleading because mm -hmm. it could mean a few different fish. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've struggled with that as well. When I first started my channel, I wanted to use the scientific names for everything. And part of that was kind of the front of, I know what I'm talking about. Look at me. I'm I'm smart. Um, but the reality is that most people don't know the Latin names, and it's not going to give them a whole lot of information. And yeah. you're right that, like, I've got Rummy Nose Tetras behind me. And Rummy Nose Tetras, the common name applies to, I think, three species um, mm. that are all from the same general basin. But... Yeah. Like, does it matter if I use the correct Latin name versus one of the of three species not. that are kind of, of interchangeable? Yeah. You have to remember the, the attrition rate that the hobby actually has. And yeah, when you start using Latin names, like 90% of the hobby is made up of people who just got into it. Yeah. yeah. And then you've got like that top 10% that's been keeping fish for longer than like three years or mm -hmm. two years. Because most people get into the hobby. They can't cycle their tanks. They're killing their fish. It's too expensive. They just get out. They lose interest. Like yeah. that's not fun to constantly have crazy death. Names. It's like overwhelming. Yeah. So if we're like, like, I don't even know what that is. Yeah. So if I'm like, hey, let's get some uh, astronautus oscillatus up in here. They're like, what? Oh yeah, the Oscar. <laughs> yeah. Like, just, what's don't the know point how to of me talking it. like that? They don't that. know how to pronounce yeah. it. They don't yeah. even know what it means. So I think it's good that you use common names with visual examples. Yeah. And, you know, some of the warnings and information that comes along with them. But Alex says something incredibly different. He um. Well, he does two things different than me. One, he puts a lot of effort into his videos <laughs> and his editing, and the, and uh, I wish I could. Um, that's where he his ta his talent truly is. But he also makes like documentary style videos, and he'll take the most mundane topic, and I'm like, oh, this is why you work for National Geographic. <laughs> you you could tell a really good story mm -hmm. with next to nothing. But it got a it, I, I got to ask, what did you do with National Geographic and like do you have like a favorite moment or or something like that that stood out? Yeah, so I I'm mainly a documentary producer. So I write the shows, I kind of like come up with a vision for it and then mm -hmm. because I mainly work on scrappy programs, I often edit them as well. And one of my favorite shows that I ever worked on was a show called Wildlife with Bertie Gregory that was set in Vancouver, Canada. So, you know, a vague oh. Canada connection. Um, yeah. And it was like 16 episodes that are all three or four minutes long that explained a specific species that lived on Vancouver Island. And what I really loved about that and what I love about doing stuff online is that it doesn't have the clickbaitiness of television. It's not trying to drag you to the next commercial break. It's mm. just... I trust that you're going to be really into this subject. So let mm -hmm. me show you how cool this animal is and you're going to love it. Um, so when you're talking about describing something that's kind of mundane, when I'm thinking about who I want to work with, the, mm -hmm. the judge that I go with is, can you make lichen sound interesting? And lichen is the stuff that grows on rocks and trees. It's really, really slow growing. And False. They are um, werewolves. <laughs> in that movie <laughs> series <laughs> with the hot girl that's like i think she's half and half vampire and werewolf they're lichens anyways well, well, uh, you've, you've gone get... off you've gone off the deep end for me i don't know what you're talking what's... about i don't oh, either what's that? <laughs> somebody in the comments is gonna know 
what is that series called? The, she's always fighting like the werewolf people, and they are lichens. They're are we talking lichens. about Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Or are we talking newer than that? Way newer than Buffy the Vampire Stop no. aging yourself. <laughs> Buffy Look, the Vampire Slayer. I, I haven't owned a television in 15 years. I don't, I don't the, know what's on television. The, the most cringe uh, show that I've ever watched, but you kind of can't not watch it because <laughs> <laughs> Buffy was kind of hot and it was interesting and it was ahead of its time sort of I guess no these lichens I don't know what it was called Underworld that's what it's called yeah gotta watch it it's pretty cool I at least know that that's a show I've heard I've heard of that show so that's yeah. something I, I've never yeah. seen it but I know so that it exists it's, it's basically vampires versus the lichens when the lichens are like let's move on so <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't ring a bell for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, three people in the conversation. One of them knows what it is, but only barely. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, you, the lichen moss. Are you saying? Yeah. So it's it's a mix of an algae and a fungus. It's a symbiosis relationship, and that combination is really really cool. But it's really boring. It grows very slowly. It doesn't move. So when I'm talking to people, I want to know whether or not they can make a story out of something that looks boring but has a really interesting concept behind it. So when you're talking about you know, trying to make something interesting out of nothing, oftentimes it's me sitting and saying, I don't really want to show another aquarium. Like I've kind of done what I can with, here's a beautiful mm. aquascape. And yeah. now I'm trying to get more and more into what is the twist on it? What is the deep dive? Which I literally just finished listening to your most recent episode that came out. And you were talking about how people that go really deep and really hard into the, the more niche subjects have a lot of trouble growing. And I totally empathize with that. Yeah. But it's what's interesting to make to me. You know, the well, generic when stuff. You're... It depends on your storytelling abilities. Uh, I believe that I used to have really good storytelling abilities because some of my favorite videos of all time, there was nothing actually happening. I was just able to tell a story for 10, 15 minutes or whatever the algorithm needed. Like, mm -hmm. you know, a stingray got trapped behind the background yeah. and I found it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, but Joey, well, let's the make thing a video is, out of that. Yeah. Joey, you're actually a very good storyteller. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're able to do that. Uh, yeah. A lot of people aren't able to fill 15 minutes and have it be interesting. It's kind of like getting stuck well, in a dinner I got to get back into that Joey mode where I wasn't so hype because I can't help it now. Now when I jump on video, I'm like, oh, this is the new – I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. It, it doesn't suck, but it kind of takes away from me wanting to be a little bit more serious. And and it's weird because you'd think I'd find out who I am and what I, I'm all about over the course of 13 years of doing this. But I don't know. I guess like life – and things and things that are going around you impact uh, the way you're making yeah. videos and Always you know and, and i did and i am like i mean i think what god made me he took a handful of mental illnesses he's like <laughs> <laughs> sprinkle it all over me he's like here's some depression and some anxiety oh you like do you do like bipolar stuff here you go <laughs> like that sort of thing it's it's easier to joke about things and laugh about them than of course it's obviously a serious subject but yeah. You know, um, it's just a defense mechanism because you're yeah. embarrassed by it and whatnot. But, you know, I do know that I've had uh, manic episodes and yeah. depressive uh, months yeah. where those videos, I don't even remember making them mm -hmm. type of thing. Yeah. yeah. So it's really weird. Now, you have a very unique voice, Alex. And I'm I'm curious if that's been... Like, I'd have to talk to, like, your best buddies or best girlfriends, whatever that, you know, I'd have to figure out. Um, and I would just say, like, is that how he sounds all the time? Or is this something that you've practiced? Um, so, yeah, if I'm if I'm doing the tank tested narration, I definitely fall into a very specific thing. And now I do it almost out of spite because I get so many comments telling me, like, why is your vo voice so terrible? I'm like, all right, well, I'll just continue to do it. But it's you like, know, hi, I'm Alex, and this is Tank Tested. It's <laughs> yeah. really, really, like, aggressively calm. Yeah, um, it's no different than my days where I was like, hi, everybody, Joey here again, and welcome back. Like, right. I'm th that sounds like I'm on the radio. Like, and, and in playing next, we're going to have Shakira shaking her booty. <laughs> <laughs> like, you do have to put on uh to an certain extent and, yeah. and i've talked to alex in person and is and i can hear that well maybe just because like i'm a fan and then i could just hear the video voice and um i think I, your I, voice is good for video i think that when people try to take you down or make it go watch something else man don't project onto mm -hmm. him like your insecurities then if if you're if you're that much of a critic that means you probably know what you're talking about go yeah. ahead and make the same video he's doing i yeah. want to see how do well you do 
you know? Yeah. And it's okay to criticize. It's okay for, you know, blah, 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 opinion. And people will be like, well, you're on the internet. That's such a s- silly thing to say. Like, oh, you're on the internet, so y- you signed up for this. Yeah, you deserve this. You deserve people <laughs> yes. to hate you and yeah, be rude so, to you. Yeah, and your horrible you personality, up. and I deserve that mm-hmm. because I'm sharing something about fish tanks. I'm Chill out, bro. To show yeah. you something cool and educate you, and you just want to <laughs> complain about my voice. It's one very of the things, funny. Um, one of but, the things I'm. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, to answer your question of you know talking to friends or, or exes and that kind of thing, when I first started tank tested, uh, my girlfriend at the time. When I would start describing what the stories that I was going to work on, she would say like, oh, you're falling into the voice of how you narrate it. When I would like describe the tank that I'm working on, I'm like, oh, you, you're doing the voice again. Just yeah, casually. I get that too. Like whenever you talk about your Aquarius, Joey, you sound so much different. Yeah. And, and you talk so much different and you sound so much smarter. Because <laughs> yeah. in my personal life, I'm pretty close to being 90% degenerate. <laughs> I curse a lot. I have such foul things to say. And, you know, um, but when I talk about fish tanks, oh, finally, something positive and something that makes me happy and passionate about, you know, besides my children, I, I act like fish tanks, the only <laughs> thing that makes me happy. <laughs> Meanwhile, my kids are just like in a cage off to the <laughs> side. Be quiet. Well, daddy works. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that I actually and um, I can cut this out if you don't want to talk about it um, no. but one of the things I was really proud of you and you made it public so I guess it's okay to talk about it but one of the things I was really proud of you for and um, I didn't want to like make too big of a deal out of it because it's it was his moment and stuff but I definitely thought and I think you might know where I'm going with this mm-hmm. is um, I don't even know the proper terminology but you came out yeah. um, and you were the first aquarium hobbyist that has a public following you're the first one to ever do it i think yeah i think that's probably true so yeah. uh to, to clarify on what come out means in that context uh, i especially wanted to come out because i identify as bi or queer or something like that yeah. and as a man i think there's not a lot of room for people to identify as bi uh you're either gay or you're straight and the, yeah. the idea of a middle ground is really gross <laughs> And, and I'll, I'll I'll just I'll capitalize on how ignorant men are because as soon as you're like I'm bi I was like oh oh well that's depressing I thought he was gonna be like he's gay or something and that would have been more exciting I <laughs> guess or more definitive and but yeah there's definitely a stigma and I'm one of those types of people but yeah. you know um, I don't mean to sound insulting but when he's like oh, I was bi I'm not also not trying to de- discredit him or yeah. be insensitive it's just like I was ex- when he said he was coming out I was excited for him because I wanted to I was it was an opportunity and this is my loyalty I, it was my opportunity to be a pit bull because when he was if i thought he was gonna say gay and i thought there would be backlash and i couldn't wait to rip people apart but <laughs> he was only bi so i was like well you'll do okay yeah <laughs> you don't need and, me <laughs> so that's that's the thing is that like when i when i came out and i still have not done it on my youtube channel um oh, and for whatever I i've, I've done it on instagram but the reason why i haven't is because like I don't talk about anything else in my personal life on my YouTube channel. So why, why bring that up? Um, Whereas on Instagram, I'm much more comfortable talking about that. But um, the thing of why I was like, I I should really do this publicly on this platform is because for most men, the idea of being bi is not really an option. And I, you know, you talked about mental illness. I have OCD as well. And for a long time, like my OCD was like, really torn up about the identity of being bi because when i grew up i was like oh you can either be straight or gay and if i'm not one of those two what what is happening and Mm -hmm. i just wanted to present that as like a this is a thing if you're struggling with you know who you are i don't want to have the ability to help people and not you know give people a role model like oh that's not that bad that seems normal alex isn't alex isn't weird no, I didn't think it weird. was weird either. And and to be honest with you, I didn't care. I respect it and everything that you, you would want me to do, but I didn't care like, oh, well, he's he's gay or sometimes he likes guys. I can't be his friend because I already knew him. Mm-hmm. And he was always my friend. Yeah. So, I mean, the only thing he could have said, like, I killed people when I was younger. I'd be like, oh, well, maybe I should distance myself. But I don't care that. Uh, and, and so what triggered you wanting to wanting to talk about that? Yeah. What what did trigger me? Um. So. What triggered me actually was, and this is a weird, weird tangent, was I went down um, to Brazil with uh, Project Piava, and I met a bunch of people down there, and talking with folks down there, I felt was like, oh, this really feels like something that is 
confusing and to a lot of other people. And knowing that, um, you know, I I was not out to everyone in my life. I was out to a bunch mm -hmm. of people, but you know, I super, no yeah, certain. And like, I've dated, I think somebody might have said something at some point. And I was like, I don't. I was like, he, I don't care. Yeah, like, I don't care. Matter. It doesn't I'm make like, a I've who they I've are dated a lot of women over the years, so it's not like anyone would be like, well, he he doesn't have a long term girlfriend. I've had long term girlfriends. There's not like. I could have easily never, never said anything, and I don't think anyone would have ever, you know, had any evidence of like, oh, I think Alex might be something other than straight. But yeah, that's that was kind of the motivation. And man, I can say if anyone is, you know, struggling with that at at their home, mm -hmm. gosh, the freedom to just be out. Obviously, yeah. everyone can't because yeah. you know their situations. But mm -hmm. if you have the freedom to, if you're not worried about your bodily harm, gosh, it is such a relief to just say like. This is who I am now. Like, yeah. There's no shame in being who you are. The shame is yeah. in hiding who you are. Um, yeah. And that's the bummer. And that's the thing that eats it. at people. Mm -hmm. Being well, open is great. And it's mind. tough to come out with people like me that joke about it sometimes. Yeah. Or like use it in a, a in an insulting way to a straight man. Like straight guys that are just like being the boys will call each other the F word or yeah. oh, that's gay or whatever. And then mm -hmm. somebody like Alex who didn't tell anybody sitting off to the side, like, well, shit, I can't tell these guys. They're just going to humiliate me and make fun of it. Yeah. So I see the error in my ways, but like, again, Alex is also older. So it probably took him a while to, cause he comes from the old school of things and the way thing, and it's not as, ex uh, the, the world isn't as accepting as, it, um, then as it is now no, yeah. and how normalized it is and that's mm -hmm. pretty interesting but it, it's going to take more work all these cultural problems it's going to take work with everybody especially like the older crowds that find it acceptable to do those sort of yeah. things and i've got to work on it myself and there's so much more like i can be incredibly offensive i don't mean to be harmless or harmful but mm -hmm. i do see the error in a lot of my ways and you know i thought it was important to talk about this and use Alex as an example as to because I know you got fans a ton of fans and they're going to see this and they're going to feel just as guilty and as bad as I am for the silly things they said and because they could have hurt somebody like Alex mm -hmm. well I, I yeah. think that you can't feel bad about what you've done in the past unless you're like really terrible but what you can do is be yeah, more I proactive know. and say like gosh if if these people that I know are queer gay trans whatever it is Maybe that's not that bad a thing because, you know, I knew them for years and thought nothing of it. So yeah. they're, they're the exact same person I've known this whole time. But, mm -hmm. I mean, Joey, when you're talking about, you know, we're slightly older. Yeah, I, I didn't come out to anyone until I was 25, I think. Oh, um, and then, you know, came out to a bunch of people but didn't come out to everyone. Yeah. Um, and honestly, like the... <laughs> my poor parents i didn't come out to my parents until uh on my twitter you know which does no crossover at all with tank tested um they saw my my bio that you know says bi or queer and they're like why didn't you tell us i was like well i mean i don't really introduce you to any of my girlfriends so why would i yeah. you know have a conversation about any of that like that's not the relationship my parents had and that's unfair to them because they're lovely people and supportive but uh, i don't know <laughs> that's, well, I thought it was an opportunity for you to kind of elaborate on it, and mm -hmm. I think it normalizes it, especially within the yeah. hobby where um, nobody talks about their personal lives, and if you do, it's so taboo. But I did. I knew that uh, a year or two years ago when I did my video exposing myself, essentially, like how the aquarium hobby saved my life, I knew I had to make that video because it was my popularity was getting to the point where people were digging into my past, and yeah, I wanted it to come to from me stuff out. before it came from anybody else. Like I wanted to control that situation. Yeah. Um, and I had a lot of family members and um, exes and that so stuff yeah. trying to extort me. And people start to make assumptions with the things that they, the little things they gather and then they believe the first thing they saw and they don't even know what's real anymore. Yeah. So I think it sort of Absolutely. kept it from going crazy. I, I think, you know, from anything from your, your sexual orientation to your history with law to your history with mental illness, whatever it is, if you're in a place and you're a leader if you're in a place that you can be a role model like hey this mm -hmm. is what this looks like it destigmatizes it because most people well, probably have never yeah. met someone that went to jail most people have probably never met someone with schizophrenia or ocd or anything like that and they think it's kind of a joke oh it'll be interesting to see the comparison and types of fans that that uh, alex has because i feel the opposite i feel like a lot of the hobby 
is made up of people with torn pasts and mental illnesses and issues. And then there's yes. like, and that's like 80% of the people. And then 10% are normal people that, <laughs> you know, had a better upbringing, et cetera. And then there's like that last 10% that, uh, um, you know, had no, there's like 90 or, and oh, and that last 10% is cops, man, a <laughs> lot of police officers and, and, uh, authority figures have, uh, Aquarians. And I think it has to do a lot with, uh, unwinding and mm-hmm. meditation yeah and a calming yeah. effect because they got to live they got to they live certain different certain lives I, and i've had like bad experiences with them it doesn't make them all bad but i can only imagine the stresses that some of them have mm-hmm. especially in the higher populated you know cities and whatnot where there's murders and stuff are common yeah. and they got to bring out their guns and it takes a certain type of person to be able to do that job i couldn't do it yeah no, no i mean way. i i, I I'd totally shoot everybody agree. I would get too angry. I'm not mentally stable enough. Yeah. Well, I think some cops aren't either, but yeah, a lot are. It's yeah. It's a, I met some of the uh, NYPD yeah, came no. out to one of my talks before in Brooklyn. Um, you know, uh, I've got actually there's YouTubers that are pretty popular that their part time or their full time job is a police officer, and he doesn't want me to talk about it. And well, they because um, there's two of them, um, and uh, I don't know why he's embarrassed or he just I think that there's the stigma. But he's a good guy, like a mm-hmm. really nice guy. Maybe he's a crappy cop but i doubt it he's too nice when you uh when after you after you came out did you notice any difference in the way people talk to you or um, Hmm. did you get any hate or anything like that or i don't think i got a single negative message which just super lucky right i mean i can't i mean i think the worst that i got was a couple of people saying like why are you bringing your personal life into this which you know whatever but that's yeah and that's not nearly as negative as i was expecting i was expecting you know like real angry aggressive homophobic stuff to no. get any of that which is pretty amazing especially yeah. given that i don't know what your audience is i'm sure it's way more balanced than mine is my audience is 90 percent male which i don't know how i ended up with that but it's 90 percent male so i was really expecting just like mine's up to there get for youtube mine's up there um i think it's like yeah 70 or 80 percent male on youtube um like 60 70 percent male on instagram and then 40 percent male on tiktok a lot of girls follow me on tiktok but i think it's just the the videos that reach the female right. demographic. I don't think a lot of guys, aquarium people, are on TikTok yeah. yet. But girls I didn't know you were are. on TikTok at all. Yeah. I've never seen you on. I mean, I I haven't really tried to find. I you, want, but I didn't know. I wanted to do it last summer, and I made this video where I'm like, "Hey, I'm new to TikTok. I don't know what I'm gonna." And then I just lost interest. I came back um, right around Christmas or something like that, right before, right after. Fall, yeah. 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 And I made a few videos. A couple of them went viral, like a million views a piece. Um, And then uh, I kept making videos, lost interest again. That's the thing. I'm not going to do something if I don't want to do it. If I don't feel like doing it, I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. I don't, it's disingenuous. Why force yourself? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and this, this whole thing is a full-time job through and mm -hmm. through. So the Mm -hmm. idea of taking on another responsibility that doesn't excite you, why, why do that to yourself? That's exhausting. It could be tough. Back to your channel though. I know that you, um, sometimes, uh, a little frustrated with growth and views and that sort of thing and i mean you've only been doing it for three years and you're at almost a hundred thousand i think after this podcast once people get to know you a little bit more you're definitely going to get up over a hundred thousand so link in uh to alex's channels in the description below but um i think that your videos will are uh are here to stay i think they're always going to be watched they're not fly by nights they're not like a, a a flashy title and i've been doing those titles and stuff for like two years now and because of that the slow burn that i usually get on a, like a lot of my older videos it's not happening with the newer ones mm-hmm. they yeah. spike tons of views tons of interest but then they crash and like right. they don't rank anymore so i definitely got to rethink the, w- the what i'm doing but i think what you're doing alex is going to pay off in the long run i i my videos definitely have a long tail to them they they continue to get viewership you know mm-hmm. years later it's amazing um and oftentimes a video will kind of just sit there for a year and then it will start to grow and then i'm yeah, just awesome. like oh it's getting a thousand views a day and it has for the last six months that's awesome yeah. um yeah. and that's really really cool i mean i think my channel now there's a lot of other channels that do cinematic aqu- or aquarium stuff when I first started, there really weren't. Um, the only person that really was doing that was uh, James Finley, the Green Machine. Um, oh, yeah. But, but he yeah. stopped doing uh, YouTube 
before I started doing YouTube. And his videos are still like, they still rank up views. So I, I think that you're, oh, yeah. you're totally right that yeah. quality lasts. Uh, but when you're talking about like clickbaity titles and everything, have you considered, because the content of your videos isn't clickbaity. You actually do prom, you deliver on what you're promising. Yeah. Have you considered retitling videos, you know, three months, four months after they come out so that they're a little bit more clickable? I know what to do to fix my channel <laughs> to do everything. I just don't do it. I'm not as obsessed as I once was. I'm more satisfied in my personal life than I ever have been previously. Yeah. You know, um, before my channel was modeled after um, get everything done and work on my channel nonstop while the kids are at school uh, and while they're in bed. So, and you know, while they're not at school, I would spend all my time with them as soon as they went to bed back out to the gallery, back out to work, back out to, the, you know, get everything done. And I was, you know, 17, 18 hour days every single day um, for years until like the rest of my life became more fulfilling. And then there's people in it that I want to be around more. And it was so weird for me because then if my channel doesn't do well or if uh, my videos aren't doing well, I'll look around me and be like, it's your fault. It's your fault this is happening as opposed to taking accountability. And yeah, I always bl I blamed her for the longest time. I was like, until I realized, I was like, oh, I just never had anybody that wanted me around as much as you do and as much as I want to be around you. And then I started with trying to work her into videos. And a lot of people were like, this is off brand having a cute girl in your videos. I was like, well, you have to get used to it. I mean, it's not it's not her fault. She's pretty, but she's a huge part of my life. And YouTube is a massive part of my yeah. life. So without YouTube, uh, Alex, you would still be working with um National Geographic? Oh, I still work there. My day job is working at Nat Geo. Um, oh. Yeah. So I'm, I mean, <laughs> Tank Tested does not pay my bills. Um, it is a, it is a second job that pays nothing. <laughs> um, but it is, uh, yeah. So I still work at Nat Geo. And then every night I'll do two or three hours of work. Cause as you mentioned, you know, I spend a lot of time on my stuff. I, yeah. 60 hours is pretty typical per video. So the fastest that I can get that out is once every two weeks. That's, I mean, that's as fast as I can go because yeah. I have a day job. Um, mm -hmm. But it is really, it's like a relationship. Uh, I have not really had a relationship since I started Tank Tested because YouTube is a relationship and that is not okay. It's that a is toxic, something that I've got to It's a come. toxic relationship too. Exactly. Yeah. It's a really Your video abusive. did well. You're in a good mood outside of that. Absolutely. Everybody around you is great. My video is not doing bad. I'm pissed. Yeah. And I'm upset mm -hmm. and I don't want to talk and I want to fix it and I want to do a better job next time. And I'm on my phone looking at it. And so a couple of, about a year or two ago, I got I got away from that. I, I couldn't be obsessive. But if you want to be successful on this platform, you have to be successful or I'm sorry, you have to be obsessive. obsessive. Yeah, you've got to. Um, yeah, there was a time on YouTube before the. Um, before watch time was a thing. And uh, so YouTube, the algorithm would be like, so at first it was a lot of people gamed the algorithm because it was all about clicks, yep. mm -hmm. not about view time. So you could put a girl in a bikini in your thumbnail and the video has nothing to do with that. Yep. And, and YouTube would be like, well, this is a popular video. So now it's gone to watch time. How long did they watch it for? And are they clicking? And what did they do afterwards? Did mm -hmm. they stay on YouTube? Did they continue to watch videos, et cetera, et cetera? But before then, I had to deal with making a do-it-yourself video, which took about 40 hours, 20 to 40 hours to create, because I'd build two, one to practice, one for the video. But I'd also have to try to collect all of the supplies mm -hmm. in, a, in a way that was common for anybody to, to find all over the world. Yeah. I could have did much more flashier projects, et cetera, but I'm not there to flex. I could yeah. have done crazy things and things could have evolved, but let me see what you can come up with with like, I don't know, piece of string in a water bottle or something like mm -hmm. figure it out accessible to anybody yeah and i had to create these videos that took 20 40 hours and it was during a time when three to five minute videos is what youtube wanted mm -hmm. um but then it obviously changed over time and it's going to be favor it favors more so long form content that's why the, i think the podcast is growing so quickly yes because yeah. they're hour-long videos i mean the next one coming out is two hours long um, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so, so Joey, uh, this is a thing that I've, I don't think I've ever said 
in terms of like the origin of my YouTube channel, which I, mm -hmm. I watched your channel for years before, you know, tinkering in my own space. And I created Tank Tested about a year before I posted anything. And the reason why it took a year was originally I had the, the thought process of I'm going to do science videos from an aquarium perspective. And oh. I fully kind of ripped off your format of the original like building a tank from scratch kind of thing. Ah, so yeah. there's a video in my hard drive of explaining exactly how glass breaks because I did a, a show about how glass breaks and like cutting it, snapping it. How long it, is it? Gluing, uh, it's maybe a 15 minute video. Um, Do you want to send it to me? I can include it in the, I can put it in at the end of this podcast or something. I've, or maybe you just upload it. I have, yeah, yeah, I haven't, I, I haven't edited it, but I can, I can oh, send you okay. some stuff from it. Fix but it, it was, and, it was uh, basically like something to do with it. Just fully ripping off your approach. Like I'd watch your videos of like exactly how to cut it, and then I would build it and I would explain oh, this, so everything. You, you just were, like wouldn't fully... be ripping off. It, it was more learning from my videos and yeah. then applying it to yours. Yeah, to totally. So, out. But that's so, that's why I called it tank tested because I was like, I'm going to test something. I'm going to do something. Yeah, that's and then cool. I never that's what did I thought it. Really cool. do too. Yeah. And then like. I didn't do that. Then I just started being like, oh, I'll fall back on what I know how to do, which is tell yeah. a documentary story about an aquarium. And it has nothing to do with Tank Tested, but that's the name that I'm stuck with. So anyway, that's name. the that's the origin of, uh, of how this came to be. And it absolutely came from, oh, I'll just kind of iterate on what Joey's doing and make it even more science-y. The, the only downside to your channel's name, and even mine, is the letter T is at the second half of the alphabet. And right hmm. now in subscription feeds, it's it's typically ranked alphabetically. So channels that start that. with an A, like Aquarium, they typically do better in terms of retaining views and getting more people to watch because they're ranking higher in that alphabetical order. And that was uh, like a huge reason why this channel is starts with the letter A. Mm -hmm. I Well, if you want to step it up, I should have put like the number one in front of it <laughs> just to like Zero. game it. Yeah, but, <laughs> you know, so I don't think you copied me or ripped me off i think that you learned from my videos and then you put it in your own words and did other One, things two. yeah you know there's Apply been some there's been some recent out. uh controversy over copycats on youtube and i think people are getting the wrong idea as to what some creators like me mean by copycats um i don't show you how to build aquariums so that you don't make a video out of it Dude, go for it what what the copycat thing is using the same type of thumbnails mm. mimicking it yeah. like at one point i decided i'm going to put my arms out in front of my aquarium and go like this mm -hmm. yeah. now almost every buddy that has a new fish tank or standing in front of a big one gotta go like this like yeah. just little things like that titles and stuff but then they start talking like you filming yeah. like you using the same like words that, that you use yeah so pretty much word for word um casey nice that used to be a huge uh, inspiration of mine when he was at oh, yeah. his height like four or five years ago. And then I decided one day, I was behind on videos and I need to make a video. So I decided I'm going to go to my friend Graham's house and do his pond. I was like, I'm going to do a vlog format. I'm going to do like little cuts, this and that and the other thing. Um, and I uploaded that. Next thing you know, Jenny does it. And we, and, and, and then the next person did it and that person did it. And vlogging came to aquariums. Yeah. And yeah. everybody started doing it. Even people that are like, oh, I can't stand him. Well, you make videos like me. Mm-hmm. You, you there without me there would have been any of you and there's not cockiness or arrogance but when you've been on a platform that long and, and you've been doing things especially when you're up top people will look up and try to replicate that type of success yeah and um that's the only thing that bugs me is like when somebody gets mad at me if i say copycat like mm -hmm. you don't even know what you're talking about i've been doing this for over a decade and watched these channels yeah. i know exactly how every channel grew there i know all of the paths they take they took even behind the scenes talking to me i knew mm -hmm. i know what they did yeah you've with seen every big channel top 20 stuff. aquarium channels i know or had impact or behind the scenes coached mm -hmm. yeah um but i don't think like with if i think that that actual tank tested theme that wouldn't have been a copycat i think no. that's that's elaborating on information that's mm -hmm. being inspired and and seeing how things worked on my channel and stuff because yeah. you don't know how to do everything until you experience it yourself and get uh, or see yeah. somebody else do it mm -hmm. yeah and on, on top of that like i mean you made it look relatively easy of snapping the glass and putting it all together and no. it, it's not it's not super challenging but like i have never been so nervous than mm -hmm. when i'm trying to snap a five foot pane of glass and like really hope this works this is terrifying <laughs> but also i sit behind the scenes and uh the piece of glass that i had i had two or three of them so i could practice on and yeah. make it and, and do it over and over and over and over and over again before i 
you know, recorded it on video mm-hmm. um, or I recorded the best snap or whatever the case might be. And then once I got better and um, like as years passed by at doing it, everything was one take. Yeah. You gained the confidence. and Yeah. Right. Learned. You got to do it all super simple, super fast within a day type of deal and bang it out. I just don't like filming it all anymore. Mm-hmm. Like step by step. I'm like, I am. I've already talked about this. I've already done yeah, a video like this. You feel this. repetitive and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, th- I think um, when I when I first started out, very quickly I found a following amongst all of the other YouTube people, you know, because mm-hmm. it was different. Um, yeah. It was different than what everyone else is doing. And I was really lucky that I was already friends with Rachel O'Leary. And yeah. she watched like That's five or six you. videos. And then she's like, I think I can shout this guy out. And, you know, she, she I mean, oof. you're talking about growing 100,000 in three years, that's because Rachel gave me the first five or 10,000. Um, but in that first six months, I I use what's called a slider, which is a, a animatronic or robotic device that moves the camera back and forth. Mm-hmm. And within three months of me gaining any popularity, every YouTuber that had any cinematic value had a slider. And yeah. very quickly, they all would like put out videos and A, that's not what makes my videos different. Um, it's mm-hmm. just a part of it. But also, I think every person realized, like, oh, this is a lot of work. It's a lot easier to go handheld than to set up each individual shot. And yeah. within six months, I, I don't think really anyone, but maybe George Farmer occasionally uses I got a, a slider. slider. I got an electric one mm-hmm. and that you program and it goes as fast as you want, how many times, blah, blah, blah. I just don't use it. For yeah, the you same don't reason. use it because like, it's, a, it's a pain. Yeah. getting in the way like and, and unless you unless you're doing like a couple of establishing shots like if you were to like really here's my finished fish room for now or my gallery for now make mm-hmm. a couple of cinematic shots other than that what is it for like it's well that's the thing about doing something unique and creative for the first time and then and like it's not like nobody can ever do what you do or yeah. try to do better or anything like that but for the original creator it can be frustrating because they were the one that took the chance they put in all the work and effort and then somebody takes that idea and does it better or gets more views etc well you are being drowned out mm-hmm. yeah. well you feel like you know and that's just a normal feeling it's a natural feeling it sucks imagine you know writing an essay and um your friend puts no work into it but they want to copy you yep. you don't want to do it and you know if you be mean or something you'll feel bad about it but you let them do it mm-hmm. you get a hundred they get a hundred and you're like man they didn't even it's just, do any of that work or put time didn't into do that. it that or was me. Yeah. that sucks I, i'm the one that sacrificed i'm the mm-hmm. one that put up put the money up i'm the one that's been trying to do this for a long time and and you come along and you know three months on youtube and start emulating and pretending and pretending yeah yeah it sucks the the thing that oh gets... and the worst is then when you start getting compared to them yeah i hate that <laughs> yeah i hate that oh the, this person's better than you or that person films better than you and i'm sure alex has gotten it or you know oh i prefer this person or that like he already talked about his, some people complain about his voice but i'm like without even without alex there would be no that shot and you being able to do that like mm-hmm. and yeah. and when people compare to me i'm like cool bro let's um what are we going to talk about fish we'll talk about fish we'll talk circles for the most part i'm flashy on video i gotta make these 10 minute videos but there's nothing i can't build yeah there's nothing i'm not willing to build i've just built everything and it's right. gotten monotonous and boring and repetitive mm-hmm. but there's nobody on the planet that has built everything that i have and documented it on video step by step and got hundreds of millions of people to watch it mm-hmm. yeah. so i'm sort of somebody's like trying to compare like there is no comparison i get that you like that person better and maybe they make better videos than me etc but there's no need to compare especially mm-hmm. when you're comparing somebody that's been original yeah joey you've i think you've re or reinvented what your channel is three and a half ish times oh yeah does that sound right like do you have specific chapters of when you were like i'm gonna do this thing differently because in my head there's three and a half times where you've done it i'm curious if yeah, you I mean, uh, a lot of external influences and, and things have happened in my personal life and, you know, even experiences on YouTube. But I mean, I would. OK, so he, here's what happened with uh, my channel and the history of it. And I'll summarize it really quickly, but it'll go to show um, that this has been an on. So I'm not, I didn't invent building aquariums. I didn't invent all the stuff that I built. I just showed you how to do it from my perspective using materials you could probably find locally. Um but yeah, at first I was um, uploading random videos, updates. I wouldn't talk, just some pictures of my fish videos or whatever, just to share locally and whatnot. 
And then it became, there was one video where people wanted to see how I built it. So I did a tutorial just with text. Yeah. Um, I've did some voiceovers before mm -hmm. and those became super popular. So I was looking at all the other channels and I, and I didn't want to cross over because I really liked the atmosphere and, and the environment that YouTube once was where there was like, if you looked at the top channels, they were all so different. This one did that, that one did that. And I was like, okay, well, I'll just do do it yourself. Nobody's really focusing on that. I'll just only do do it yourself videos. Mm -hmm. So um, I started doing that. People were like, man, you're the DIY king. You're the king of DIY. You're awesome. Blah, blah, blah. So I was like, man, that's a lot better name than Waru Joey. U A R U J O E Y. <laughs> for two, two, a number of things, nobody could spell it, nobody yeah. could pronounce it, and it ranked horribly in the algorithm. So I went to the king of DIY. In retrospect, I should have did like the aquarium king of DIY, something like that. But uh, I just went, went with it, started getting on video, doing tutorials step by step. Then I got a flower horn, um, started laughing, started More having more fun, did yeah. a couple little vlogs. And I realized people watch me not only for the content, but they also want to watch me. Mm -hmm. And that was a tough pill to swallow because I was always self-conscious that I was going to get made fun of or that they were going to tease me. Um, or make fun of my my appearance or that I'm young or something like that. I didn't think they would take me serious But uh, yeah, I started vlogging but before I did that I did I titled my videos how to in capital yeah. letters then two colons mm -hmm. and then the title of the video Wasn't long after that that everybody started titling their videos and I didn't invent that I seen it at somewhere else or something and I started yeah. doing I wanted to bring it to the aquarium hobby But then everybody started doing that then I started vlogging Then everybody started vlogging the original vlogger was Dustin's fish tanks but yeah. he didn't do several cuts or anything like that. It was just holding the camera up and turning it and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. it's not like I was the first, but the first to popularize it. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, as soon as the gallery started, I was, there was too much content to take too long making the videos. So I had to almost go daily and be more myself. And I don't know, just things transition slowly. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I guess I, I, I just... I've been doing it for too long and I don't I don't I don't remember what it was like to make videos like that three four years ago or two years ago mm -hmm. yeah and if so, you try to copy it sorry no, go if ahead. you try to copy it and you start to feel like I feel like if you say it once and you try to act the way you acted it becomes across very like fake and you're trying too hard yeah. because you're trying to be that person but mm -hmm. you're thinking about it too much at that point yeah, and that's happened to me uh, plenty of times, and I over over overact, or I don't have enough energy, or you know. Um, but I'd rather make videos like this than go back to being robotical. Mm -hmm. I got to hear Alex's take on this, mm -hmm. though. What, um... Well, yeah, because from my perspective, there was there were the first few years, which you, I'm sure you still get comments of, like, why don't you go back to what you originally did of the oh, DIY, yeah. the how tos, yeah. and then there was the point where you brought everyone into your basement your fish room. Where you yeah. had your Shelleys and you had the mm. uh, Asian marijuana, and like I guess office. yeah, yeah, your office. And I guess you did. Ha did you have Frank before the gallery? Yeah. Okay. So then there was that mm -hmm. section, and then I remember when the video that you posted about the gallery and you know the crowdsourcing to make that happen happened, mm -hmm. and I was dating uh, a woman at the time, and I was like, "This is wild. This is like, a, I I mean, this is how many years did you put in to build that reputation that people trusted yeah. you? But it was." A long time then there's the gallery where you got it all set up but then the 3.5 that I'm referring to is once the gallery was stable I think that you're like well what now what do I do and you started the cycling and coming up with new things and the smaller tanks yeah. again and I'm I the reason why I asked was I'm curious from the perspective of for me when I iterate it's rarely chasing views it's because I'm bored it's because I'm just mm. like I don't I don't want to do this again yeah and I'm wondering, is that what's hap what happens with you when you're iterating? Um, no, I got to, I just got put up on too high of a pedestal. Hmm. I was um, expected so much of me, and I had to lead the way because as soon as the gallery started, you'd, you'd notice that everybody was calling stuff a gallery, and they right. needed a gallery. And I picked a aquarium gallery because nobody was using it. Mm -hmm. They were calling it their fish room or this. And at the time, I was playing around with influence of branding. I had just read this book called um, Primal Branding, um, and I was like, man, it would be funny, like, as a practical joke. And I filmed this clip before anybody ever heard the name of it. I'll have to find it. But I was like, 
I'm going to pick the name Aquarium Gallery because it's absurd and it's self-righteous and, and it's such a, <laughs> a silly name, but I bet you everybody's going to start calling it that. I wonder if we can influence people to accept the fact that this is now called the Aquarium Gallery. Mm -hmm. And it was just like an experiment and then I stuck, I stuck with it. And it's yeah. no longer an Aquarium Gallery to me because I stepped too far away from the, uh, the origins of it. I was highly influenced by the Chicago Aquarium, the Shedd Aquarium, yeah. where you, they have uh, an aquarium of every area in uh, the world. And I wanted to kind of replicate that on a smaller hobbyist scale. Um, but then, you know, hitting the trending page and then you're doing millions of views and you have to keep up that. Uh, and it was unobtainable. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I didn't know how I was going to be able to continue to do this. So I was like, OK, got to change. You have to keep moving. And I was letting allowing the Internet to influence too many of my decisions because up to the point of the gallery, I never listened to anybody. I did yeah. what was what they liked to watch and mm -hmm. I paid attention, but I never let them influence what was coming next. Right. And for the past couple of years, I have been like I've got into planted tanks. I'm not into planted tanks. Why am I doing this? I don't even mm -hmm. want them like I like them and it's fun and it's exciting and I made the video for you and they did really well. But yeah. I don't like that nearly as much you as I like a biotype aquarium stuff, or, yeah. you know, something that's designed specifically for the fish. That to me is far more exciting and interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think that because of um, because we've gone towards uh, letting too many people impact what's going on out there, I need to circle back. Yeah. And uh, I do know what the next big thing is. I do have some appointments next week and some things I want to work on. But um that's something people ask me all the time. What's the next big thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Boy, do I got a big plan. It's we'll see what works. happens. We'll see what happens. It's going to be <laughs> really expensive, but Joey is, yeah, is, so. is the next big thing still in the aquarium world or is it? Outside oh yeah. Of the aquarium yeah, world? yeah. 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 I mean, I got side stuff. I mean, um, without YouTube, I'm still fine. I mean, I, 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 I've, um, YouTube isn't the only thing that, you know, I, I need to depend on or anything like that, but, um, the next big thing is still aquarium related if I'm talking next big thing for my channel and it is huge and it will be public and by that I mean open to the public that is we'll see. that is a big deal yeah we'll That's see what cool. happens though I mean it's an expensive uh, undertaking and lot, lots of negotiating to do and whatnot but uh, I'm going to going to bring something to Atlanta Canada that's never been here before at all and I think mm -hmm. it's going to be pretty pretty impressive and pretty fun and interesting and it's going to get right back to where i want to be i don't yeah. care what anybody says yep. or thinks but um that's awesome one of the um yeah back to the gallery starting so i started making like uh, i think it was late 2017 my channel finally started to take off started making money but it was like money i had never seen in my life i um you know for the longest time i'd make a few hundred bucks a month and i wasn't breaking even it was it was I was in a deficit at all times. I had to have a full-time job to help pay for everything. Um, then I started like taking it a little more serious and realizing, okay, Joey, get over yourself. You have to try to make a little bit of money and make more videos and try to have different avenues of revenue and whatnot. But stay true to yourself. I, anyways, I started making more money, and it was like went up to 2000 then 3000 a month, mm -hmm. then 5000 then $10,000 in a month. Here I am paying off debt. Um, uh, you know, all this money and excitement and this wonderful feeling. And I want everybody to experience around. I'm very generous. You know that. Yeah. Um, you know, bought my, my girlfriend a wedding ring and let's plan the wedding and don't worry about it. And I'll pay for it. And everything's good. Um, and I'm going to also plan out this new building for a gallery, start paying it. I got, I'm like 30,000 into it or something like that. And then PewDiePie got to go and be racist. <laughs> And the ad apocalypse happened, and it and it right. affected my channel. I went from making ten thousand, fifteen thousand a month to I think it was that March where I made a hundred bucks or less than a hundred bucks, oh and everything gosh. just flatlined. Yet I have um, I have these massive bills I got to pay, so I started using my credit cards. I was going to refinance the house. I was going to I didn't know what to do, but there was no end in sight. Um, and I kind of the entire time the gallery was being built. I mean, it was almost completely finished on the inside. I was getting harassed hard. Let us help you. Why don't you let get over yourself? Let us help you. We want to help you. We we know how expensive this is. We know why you're doing it. Because I don't need the gallery. The gallery isn't for me. I don't want it. Mm -hmm. It's for the uh, for the hobby. And, mm -hmm. and, and people can be like, oh, it's just for you and just to make money off it and blah, blah, blah. That's not what history proves. Mm -hmm. I never made anything from this. Yeah. And I yeah. knew the influence I was having and, and things that I, I could do for the hobby. And it was, I was, I was entering a territory that nobody was really at, uh, touched before. 
So I upload this 25 minute video, updating the gallery. Never before was I uploading videos that long. I uploaded it that long because at the last two minutes I asked for help. Mm -hmm. There was two versions of that video, one with asking and one with not asking. Um, I didn't have any power in the house. We were getting the electrical upgraded that cost me over $5,000. I had no idea how I was going to pay it. I uploaded the video and shut the computer off. It was the one asking for help. Within 47 hours, uh, $90,000 was raised. Never in the history of the hobby has any amount of that amount of money been raised for anything, let alone within 47 hours. Yeah. It was absolutely insane. So when people were like, oh, Joey's so controversial, people hate him, do they? do they and then when i shut it off when i didn't need any more money people were still mad that they couldn't help me oh, i didn't see it let me help you and send you this and send you that and i was like i don't need it mm -hmm. it was a tremendous amount of money that was ninety thousand. i think it was like five six seven thousand dollars went to fees for paypal and gofundme then the canadian government was like you can't dump that kind of money in your account without giving us a cut half of it goes to taxes and it was in canadian dollars um so half it gone to taxes um you know, I didn't get as much as people think, but it definitely kept us afloat. Right. Months later, three, four months later, my revenue went back up to normal. Um, and I don't regret it because it pro it was it was so groundbreaking for the hobby to somebody, an individual to raise that kind of money. Um, I just like people will look for anything to criticize you about and to attack you about. And that comes up. It used to come up way more. But people are like, oh, he's just begging for money really i made nine uh, videos for nine years for free it cost you nothing yeah. and i never asked for anything from anybody ever mm -hmm. i finally listened to the comments and my subscribers and i'm talking by the thousands that were unsubscribing and hated me because i wouldn't let them help them to letting them help and then the, the taxes situation happened and you know things are a lot better now but i have given back i mean i don't advertise how much money i but if you ever seen me in a somebody's super chat i've given at least ten thousand dollars back in super chats yeah at I've, least I've, over the past i've three seen years. you pop into my super chats in the past which yeah yeah i mean it's it's i i think that the fact that people gave you money has to do with the fact that you did nine years of work beforehand yeah. you know yeah. it's it's not really giving I, I people don't see video and content and you know, entertainment as having a value mm -hmm. at all. Um, that's a problem with the industry that I'm in. You know, people yeah. want everything for free, but the reality is that it comes at a cost. It comes at the cost of the content creator. So nine years of content, uh, it's a pretty, that's a pretty paltry paycheck for nine years of work, frankly. Well, it was, so, it was, it was a staggering amount of sacrifice and giving up a lot of things. Yeah. Because, I mean, when I worked full-time and did YouTube, I'd wake up in the morning. I'd have to be to work by 11. 11 to 7 is typically what I was working around uh, for many years. Um, I'd wake up in the morning, and for, uh, I'd have coffee, and I'd catch up on editing and comments. I'd go to work. I'd come home. Uh, same thing, editing, website work, because I do everything. Nobody runs my websites. I do. Nobody creates them. I do. I learned how to do everything mm -hmm. over years. Um, and then finally, the weekend would hit time to make videos and i lived that life forever for yeah. years and years and years um so yeah when i put in that kind of sacrifice and then i see people like kind of benefiting off of it and never shouting you out never saying you know this was inspired by so and so like mm -hmm. can i get a little bit of credit yeah it, you you didn't have to do what i did you didn't have to sacrifice you didn't have to put in that kind of time and you know people can be like oh he's bitter or sad and blah 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 sucks when it happens to you it's okay when you're hearing it to happen to somebody else mm -hmm. but people and i think i think it's happening yeah i can't i can't speak for you on this but i'm i'm gonna try <laughs> which is that uh for me it's credit is not about like oh it's gonna get revenue it's gonna get like whatever subscribers yeah. it's credit is cheap it's acknowledgement of mm -hmm. who inspired you who did something yeah and it's really especially in like the industry that I'm in, which is television, people are so stingy with credits. People are so against like, oh, if I if we credit all the people that actually did this, it makes what I did on it seem less than. Yeah. And the reality is like, give people credits. They're, they're literally free. It's free yeah. to mm -hmm. tell someone that this person did something for you. It's free. So just yeah. do it. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's, you know, people it's people It's tough, feel especially like, for yeah. struggling creators because this is the stuff. <clears throat> now, a lot of people... I, I see, especially with the podcast, <clears throat> is some people are going to be upset that we're talking about this sort of thing. 
it's not relatable or anything like that. It's there true. will be the odd person, but many people will find it interesting, fascinating, and get to know. That is the point of the of the podcast. I'm mm -hmm. not trying to have like how fun would it be Alex if I was like hmm so Alex what is your top three favorite fish and before you answer that how did you get into the hobby and after you answer me that can we tell what's your next big yeah I've done those interviews and they suck I'm like I'm right here with you you can ask me anything I'm an open book mm -hmm. about most things yeah um something some questions are tacky and I know everybody's like how much money do you make that's like a huge question everybody wants to know and I'm open to talking about that, but I also don't have to reveal my personal finances to the world. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, know, I don't know. I think uh, I like the podcast. I like the way like it's going. It. And, you know, if I like it, then I'm going to keep doing it. And uh, I, it's going to be you. Uh, it's going to be real. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that the aquarium hobby is missing for a lot of the time because, because we get highly edited versions of, of people. Yeah. And a lot of the times yeah. they're able to hide behind that. And even though with like even Alex, I mean. I didn't mean to make this about me or, you know, bring up, but I want people to know him better. Mm -hmm. I think that's very, it's very important to me yeah. and how hard he works. And if I have to sacrifice myself and say, yeah, I get pissed off when people copy me or do this or that and the other thing, and then so be it. Mm -hmm. And not every guest is going to have that type of experience where they feel like that might have happened to them a little bit or not at all. Or, But uh, I also want to, I, I know when he came out on Instagram, I was like, this isn't a big a deal as it should be. It should definitely be celebrated more. Um, so I don't know. I wanted to talk about it for another reason. Yeah. But. Well, I mean, I appreciate you you bringing it up because yeah, it's important to me. Yeah. Not not on, on a personal level, but as a you know, hopefully it connects with people. And I, I hope that conversations like this, even though they're super in the weeds about YouTube. Hopefully they're relatable from a perspective of if you're starting your own business or if you're working yeah. on projects. Like these are all, they're not YouTube specific. They're mm -hmm. global in terms of it's really hard to start your own business. It's really hard to get motivated to keep doing things week after week. And it's, I always am balancing like, is this actually worth it? It's creatively satisfying, but is it actually worth it? Am I going to wake up in five years and be like, man, I, I'm lost five years of my life to something that never really gave mm -hmm. me anything back um yeah. and I, that's i like i i whenever people dm me and they're like talking about what their their channel is that they want to create the thing that i give advice which sucks is if there's something that you can do that will make you as happy as doing youtube you should do that thing because mm -hmm. you're signing up for something that is a pain to do yeah. and gives very little back and i think that's true of starting your own business as well. Like, if you can be happy working for someone else, it's a lot easier to work for someone else than to work for yourself. But if you're not going to be happy working for someone else, then yeah, maybe you should start your own business. That's yeah, absolutely. A lot of people are scared to start their own businesses because mm -hmm. they think they'll need a couple million bucks or a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars today. Right. You do not need anything because what most people won't do is put in the time. They quit too quickly. Yes. If you would have told me that, uh, see, they, this, these days are different. So if you want to be a YouTuber, you can look up and see the, how successful some of these bigger channels are. But I didn't see that. Uh, I was the number one channel at 10,000 subscribers or 20,000 subscribers. And I wasn't That's making wild. any money at all. Period. I just loved doing it and I wanted to do it. And there's, mm -hmm. I made time for it. Yeah. And it took me like five, six, seven years before I made a penny. And my first check or my first monthly earnings was like 43 cents. I never did it for the money. I, I, I did it because I loved it. And if you're truly passionate about an idea, chase it. It doesn't matter how long it's going to take. The ride mm -hmm. to the top is amazing. Yeah. Um, but it would double down on whatever you're good at. Mm -hmm. A lot of people want to do things that they're not yes. good at. Yeah. You have to double down on what you are good at. And that's why Alex makes his documentary style. He's good at it. That's mm -hmm. what he likes doing. He wanted mm -hmm. to do other stuff and be unique and different. Then he just resorted back to like, hey, I'm just going to be myself and this is what I yeah, like. This yeah, is, this is my creative outlet. And I think, I don't know, I think he's doing a great job. What good. are you going to get put on your um, your silver plaque, your silver play button plaque? Are you putting Alex or like your name or are you putting I, your channel name? I didn't know that was an option. It is, yeah. You fill it out. <laughs> um, I would probably put my actual name because I, from a selfish point of view, um, my job is still kind of tangentially related to YouTube. And, you know, it only helps me from a professional standpoint of being able yeah. to go into a job yeah. interview and be like, I built this thing from scratch. I yeah. can help your brand that actually has money yeah. <laughs> build something. Yeah. 
That's the interesting thing. See, I had when I got my silver one, um, I was scared that if I didn't put in Waru Joey, that they wouldn't send it to me. So I did that. <laughs> but in the second time, I was like, I don't care if I get the plaque or not. I mean, nobody cares that I have it. Mm -hmm. It was more just my own accomplishment type yeah, of thing. So I was like, eh, yeah. I'll try King of DIY. And it worked. And it came to me. And there's no hiccups. I didn't wait too long, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if this channel does it, I'll put the podcast but i do think it would be cool to have had joey mullen or something mm -hmm. like that do you so I, I, do you have a i mean <laughs> to get to get bleak do you have an exit strategy in terms of uh, social media is going to iterate a bunch over the next 20 30 years i don't think this mm -hmm. is a forever gig for anyone right mm -hmm. um is there a thing that you would want to do outside of youtube or is it kind of like this is just where you are in your life i got a lot of things i want to do but uh, YouTube is a, a massive part of my identity. Like, I yeah. don't know who I am without it. Yeah. I can go two, three weeks without making a video, but something inside of me start, starts dying and making me sad and depressed. I'm like, oh, it's because I've taken a step away from the only thing that I've known for the past, like, 13 years. Yeah. Uh, it's a massive part of me. Do I think that, do I have an exit strategy? Yeah. The moment I'm no longer happy doing this, I'm not saying a goodbye. I'm not making a goodbye video. I'm just going to stop making videos. Yeah. I just won't. I mean, I, I've, uh, financially, I could I could I could have stopped a year or two ago. A lot of the things that I did and the money that I made is reinvested elsewhere, and and I've invested most of it here. But you know, for example, the set was like fifteen grand. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a, and I don't even know if this will work. I just want to do it. Yeah, I'm excited about it, and I had the, the the money to do it, and said screw it, let's go for it. But my exit strategy is. A lot of the business ideas are not going to be it's not gonna i'll it's not a good idea that i stay in the public eye like i'm gonna be busier with other stuff and i don't want to oh. be associated for the rest of my life like that's the fish guy the aquarium guy i want to be known for individual businesses or whatever um but yeah i got i mean i have like some ambitions and things i want to do i guess i never thought of it I, sure. I just never put two and two together like hey one time point you're gonna be quitting youtube or it's not forever i do know it's not forever um, but I never contemplated what I would do outside of it. I already do other stuff outside of it, but. But at its, at its core, I mean, for me, I can't imagine ever doing something that's not storytelling driven. That's mm. not about the, the art of creating something that conveys science and storytelling. And I don't know what that path looks like. It could look like terrible poverty in 15 years when television has completely collapsed you know it could be anything but it's yeah. that's i can't imagine doing something else um you know i watch all of these youtubers create stores and sell stuff and that's where the money is and i look at that i'm like i don't i can't do that i have nothing no part of me would get any joy from selling stuff and it's no shade against people that do it's that mm. it wouldn't bring me any joy and i i just that's why i asked was it sounds like the art of creating and maybe you don't see it as an mm. art but the art of storytelling is yeah. what motivates you more than than anything yeah. else well i don't think i think even if social media were to disappear the the humans will communicate for the end of time and there will yeah. always be a form of communication and getting your uh voice across and if youtube has taught me anything it's taught me that if you truly are passionate about something and you're talented and you chase it you put in the time and sacrifice odds are you'll get to where you want to be yeah. But yeah. again, most people quit too soon. Oh, I've been doing this for two years and it's, and then they start getting mad and frustrated. I see it in the aquarium hobby. People want to, I've inspired them in some way to start a YouTube channel. They start making videos and after six months or a year, they're complaining and they're not growing and they're then not seeing the results. They get mad they at me. Like all right of a sudden away. they hate yeah. Joey and I can't stand him. And I'm mm. like, what are you doing? It's like, it's not my fault. Like mm -hmm. maybe you're just not built for this. Yeah. Like do something else that you're really good at instead mm -hmm. of doing something that you just want to do or yeah. to be like. I think you always have to be somewhat good at and connected to whatever you end up doing. Um, you mentioned that you love storytelling. Have you ever thought about writing a book and storytelling in that way? I have. Yeah. But, but not about fish. Uh, right. I, the thing that I've, I've always wanted to do a book on. I, I shouldn't be telling the world what I want to talk about. But <laughs> George I'll, Farmer I'll, was on, and he already disclosed all of his plans and things he wanted <laughs> yeah. to do. But. but like the thing that I really want to do is I want to do a book on typography because so I'm I don't just have OCD. I'm also crazy dyslexic. I cannot read for anything. But my job essentially is a professional writer, which is mm -hmm. wild that that's the job that I do. 
But I love the art of typography. I love how letters are shaped and how they became the way they are. And I would mm. love to tell a narrative book about that, about the yeah, origin of where our letters came from. Um, well, you'd have to go back so far. Egyptian yeah. times, right? hieroglyphics. Yeah, you've, you've um, got to go back thousands of years. And well, hieroglyphics are probably the most famous ancient, but they're not the most ancient. No, I mean, no. I mean, humans have been, like I said, communication between humans is going to go on forever and ever. Mm -hmm. You just have to figure out. I don't know what's after social media. Yeah. I don't think it's ever going away. I think there'll think, always yeah. be. I think YouTube has. Well, I think it was like three, four years ago, maybe more. Uh, YouTube overtook television in terms of uh, viewership. Yeah. yeah. Um, but television also took over newspapers mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, Books. radio. Yeah. You know, if, if you look back on how people communicated, of course, it was through radio and then it was television and then it was the Internet and YouTube social media. But what's next? I don't know. But if you'd have to learn and adapt and be willing to do certain things. But I don't think I don't think YouTube's going anywhere for a while. Yeah, Storytelling always will always survive. Relevant. Yeah. Right? yeah. Storytelling will always survive. It's just a matter of mm -hmm. how you go about it. The, the question yeah. that, get, that gets me nervous is will it survive in a way that allows people to exclusively be storytellers because you're exclusively mm -hmm. a storyteller i am as well um even though we get our paychecks from different sources and at some point is this sounds weird but you know storytelling is so democratized through tiktok and instagram and all these things mm -hmm. that the money that goes into storytelling it used to be from television where there's like three or four yeah. channels it's getting spread out to the point where everyone is a part-time storyteller yeah, and that's what it. gets me scared yeah. is I don't know what my skill set is outside of the thing that I do. I think you have to go where the masses are. Hey, you know, um, when's the last time you bought a magazine? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of advertising dollars was going into magazines yeah. and they were able to stay afloat. Now those magazines are like, or those advertisers are like, we can control our own narrative by building our own social media platforms yeah. and we reach far more people with the exact message we want we're not on page 37 down in the corner wondering if somebody s happened to read that ad mm -hmm. you know um, and because of that print's dying and a lot of people from print are upset with influencers and or social media creators because we're taking from them yeah and i've always said and i've said it a number of times a lot of times where i've gotten people to start making videos or because i'm trying to bring more credible sources to youtube because I do fear for the future because a lot of the times the, the most popular creators on the platforms are not the most educated or correct or the best sources of information. The best ones are not making YouTube videos or their channels are so small they can't be found. Mm -hmm. And because mm -hmm. of that, if we fast forward time, three, four, five years, we're going to be stuck with like people that just have no clue what they're talking about. And the, the, the direction of the hobby is only going to go down. Mm -hmm. It's it's. I think that the social media allows us to reach far more people. Yeah. But um, it also uh, allows it to uh, the less knowledgeable mm -hmm. to capitalize on the popularity of it. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. I think people still need to go back and do research after they hear something from one person. I think you still need to go. Don't and have see, to. Like, Not when it comes to social media. Do you think? I know. But do you, you think should. anybody? <laughs> do you think anybody cross checks me? Because I got a million subscribers. Yeah, I know. So they see that number and they're like, oh, That's well, they must be right. They care about. Yeah. Though. Yeah. yeah. So they need to look back and be like, hey, what are what was that person's sources? Like, where did they get that information? Yeah. And is that information even truly correct? Mm -hmm. um, but people just want quick results. Yeah. It's a lot about, I think, immediate, like, I want to see it now. I want to know this now. And they're not looking at, like, well, does this even really make sense? Yeah. Right. I think when I, so when I started in television, it was 2010. Uh, and at that time, social media was starting to take off. YouTube was starting to be a thing. But the biggest YouTubers weren't that big. They had a couple million no. followers. And... Uh, by who three was, or four years, they? In. Ray, Ray, Ray William Charles. Yeah, like uh, Ray Ray jo Johnson. Oh, Ray William Johnson. Yeah. What do I say? Oh, oh. <laughs> who do I say? Charles. Oh, James Charles. <laughs> um, but but at the time, you know, being inside of television, not 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 Geo specifically, but in terms of production companies, there was mm -hmm. so much frustration and, and hatred towards the YouTubers because it was like, this is our thing. We know how to make video. We know how to tell stories. What are these people doing? And yeah. The, the reality is that the wonderful thing about social media is that it democratizes it and allows people that don't have the access. Because the people that are in the television world, they're not necessarily the best. They're the people yeah. that got lucky yeah. or yeah. had a connection. Um, yeah. 
and I got lucky, like no question, I got lucky. But that doesn't mean that I was the best person to tell stories. Uh, mm -hmm. But YouTube has proved like there are people that are really, really good, and then there are people that are okay. And mm -hmm. you grow or you don't based on how good you are. And well, I think one of I the fears that we all have. I think there's something to say about a long longevity in creators as well. Yeah. Where there could be explosions and growth for some, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but based on how talented you actually are will dis depict if you can survive longer than two years yeah yeah and and yeah. whether or not your con i mean that's the other crazy thing is that in the past television shows were canceled after a few years you know a show mm -hmm. a really successful show has three or four years in the spotlight and then it goes yeah. off and then it gets canceled yeah. in youtube there's no one canceling us oh well, yes there you is know, <laughs> that that type of canceling, yes. but there's YouTube is not calling you up and like Joey, I have bad news. Yeah. We're cutting yeah, funding. Yeah, you're out. not getting the yeah, they, um, yeah. That's what you mean. And and for that, like we have to, <laughs> you either have to reinvent yourself or people get bored. And it doesn't mean that you're bad at what you do. It means that even the best television shows, you get bored after three or four years. You've seen what that thing is. So yeah. I like for me, I'm definitely approaching that point of I need to reinvent myself both creatively because I'm bored. You but have also to, you have to because, adapt and change or yeah. you will sink. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because people will be like, I saw that. It was amazing. But I, mm -hmm. I kind of, I've seen a hundred of them. I think it's yeah. time yeah. to see something well, different. Well, it goes back to when you said, oh, I want, I, w I miss the old Joey. I want the old Joey back. Well, a couple problems there. I'm not who that guy was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And neither yeah. are they. Yeah. Like you don't like everything you liked 10 years ago. You're not into everything that you liked 10 years ago. You don't even talk or sound or look like you did 10 years ago. And if you do... Well, like Alex, who's f f 58 years old, <laughs> he looks like 20. No, but uh, yeah, just, that's just not me anymore. Yeah. And I've had to change and adapt to go with the algorithm, what viewers actually want. Mm -hmm. And some people are like, we want the do-it-yourself videos back. Okay, so I make them. Nobody's watching them. Some people watch, but I, gotta, I got to uh, project to the most amount of people I possibly can. Because mm -hmm. my goal here is to have as much of an impact on the aquarium hobby as I absolutely possibly can. Yeah. and inspire people to get into it yeah. and keep the minute not just get the minute i want to keep the minute yeah yeah so i want on the like the keeping the minute like the implied thing there that i think everyone goes through is you kill the first few fish that you keep like everyone yeah. does um yeah. and that's something that i struggle with from a moral perspective of oh i'm inspiring people people message me with their aquariums and they're so excited I'm like that's great but at the end of the day, I know that I'm inspiring people that are going to then kill fish. And yeah, but you did too. It's I did too. Part and, of it. and it's not like that they're doing something wrong. I just struggle with like the, oof, I'm, I'm propagating this thing. And I, like from whatever reason, I have a weird ethical code of like, do I, am I, is it my fault that those fish died? No. Yeah, but even <sighs> if you weren't doing it, like you're probably helping them to do it less that's than the they hope. would that's anyway. The I mean, if you, if you want to think about that butterfly effect, I mean, who inspired me to get into the hobby? Yeah. That pet store that's bankrupt, is it their fault that I got so many people into the hobby and those people that got into the, like, Whose fault is it? Mm -hmm. it's, no, that's, it's a, that's a really good point. I don't have no guilt because mm -hmm. everybody has to go through the learning uh, curve and not yeah. everybody's killing off their fish when they first get into the hobby. Yeah. Some, if they uh, do their proper research, especially on the nitrogen cycle, like, and that's something like uh, interviews often ask, like, what's one piece of advice you can give anybody? And I always say the same thing. It's broken record stuff for me. The single most important factor of the aquarium hobby is the nitrogen cycle. Once you have a comprehensive understanding of this and how it works, you're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Everything's yeah. going to be fine. Mm -hmm. But most people want to talk about stocking and certain fish and scapes and stuff like that doesn't matter. Yeah. The number one thing they need to learn is how to keep the fish actually alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so do I feel guilty? Do I feel bad if some, I get somebody into the hobby? I joke about it because some people are like, oh, uh, they'll me or they'll even talk in person, message, whatever. Um, they'll always say something like, you know, um, it's your fault I'm in the hobby and my wife hates you. Stuff like that, they'll say. And I'm like, you're a grown ass man. You got yourself in the hobby. You made this decision. I inspired you to want to do it, but it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not my fault. Yeah. So if you're causing uh, stress or financial, and it's, they're only, it's all lighthearted yeah. comments and stuff, but... At the end of the day, I mean, um, that's, you know, I talk about it for years now. I'm just here to inspire and educate, get mm -hmm. people in the hobby, and I'm going to do it however I can. When the gallery first began, I said in the live stream, 
And I even said, I was like, oh, I don't know if I should tell you guys this, but the purpose of the gallery and what we are going to do is set up all these tanks. Once we're done setting them up and all these different fish from different areas and different scapes, we can start again and do it mm -hmm. again and again and again. And because of the reason for doing that is because I had 10 tanks to experiment and do this stuff with. Mm -hmm. What if those 10 tanks didn't reach everybody? Yeah. I can't expect everybody to like one tank out of those 10. Maybe they don't like any of them, so it doesn't inspire them. But if I keep trying and keep rolling the dice and seeing what people are going to like and what they're going to be interested in, et cetera. The downside to that is I think that um, I should have stuck to a lot of these tanks and added to them, et cetera. But I was ordering wholesale fish and getting 20, 30 of one species, and that's really all that can go in there. I could, mm -hmm. I should have did things tremendously different if I'm looking back in retrospect. But um, that's our goal. And, and as a creator, Alex, that's basically yours as well, is to educate and inspire and get people yeah. into the hobby. And and uh, you want them to, I mean, and, and the plus is you get to talk about something and create something that you truly enjoy. And at some yeah. point, you know, get monetary uh, reward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, one of um, one of my old bosses. She used to like run sixty minutes. I don't know if you have sixty minutes in Canada, um, but you know, yeah. a staple in the United States. Yeah, we have. Um, she was, you know, involved with that. And one of the things that she said to me, it really stuck with me, was this idea that it doesn't matter how good the thing is that you make if no one sees it. Like yeah. you can be really precious with something and make it perfect, but if you reach twenty people. You're not changing the world, but if you yeah. can make something that's good enough and that reaches a million people, well, yeah. if you're trying to save a species, if you're trying to make people care about you know their local stream, the way mm -hmm. to do it is to reach people, not to reach a couple of individuals. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the incredible gift that both of us have is that if there's something I care about, I can make a video about it and inspire people to know that that animal exists. Because no one is going to care about conservation. My, my thing is obviously conservation. No one's going to care about an animal unless they fall in love with it. You can tell yeah. someone like, oh, this fish is going extinct. And yeah, um, why, why would I care? But if you can show its, its breeding garb and show that it, like, it's a good parent, and you're like, oh, what, a, what an awesome animal that is that yeah. has parental mm -hmm. instincts and you know, a life and motivations, suddenly mm -hmm. you want to keep that thing alive. You want to make sure that that exists. And that's, I mean, I've gone off on a tangent, but that's the thing that gets me really excited is. I well, if you're not excited about something, don't expect anybody else to be. Exactly. If you're not passionate about something, don't expect anybody else to be. And if you are exactly. a talented storyteller, you can project emotion onto other people. Mm -hmm. You can, you control. And that's a big part of being a YouTuber is you are also a puppet master of emotion. Yeah. You want them to be happy. You got to be happy. Mm -hmm. You want them to be sad or be affected by it. You, you select certain music, et cetera. Yeah. You know, everything is a. Uh, you know, um, emotional manipulation and the yeah. biggest and most successful channels are really, really, really good at that. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're amazing at it. And mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, I don't, I don't think that you have that, that particular motivation, but certainly when you pick a species, you're picking what every aquarium store in the country is going to need to stock because people are going to be like, I want that thing. I want, yeah. I want Oscars now mm -hmm. you know i didn't really consider and that was a big thing with the galleries um evolution was the reason why i had to stock certain fish because people were like oh you should be keeping something rare and exotic and you know something we don't see every day no because when i did the shell dweller tank mm -hmm. everybody wanted shell dwellers now yeah. every youtuber got shell dwellers but everybody wanted them but they breed in such small numbers and they're not that commonly available but it didn't matter they all wanted shell dwellers yeah. and then frank came along and uh, flower horn prices doubled and tripled. Mm -hmm. uh, every fish that I was getting, I was getting emails and calls from exporters from all over the world. What is your next fish? We need to prepare and make sure we have the numbers to support it. That's yeah. wild. Uh, yeah. And I was like, oh, shoot. I was like, I got to start stocking fish in these aquariums that everybody can actually get. And that's when I realized what I was doing. I, I was subconsciously trying to do it, just like the Shed Aquarium inspired me to set up 10 different locations in the world. Mm -hmm. I knew that right around that time that not only should I be doing that, but I have to stock it with fish people can actually get. These tanks mm -hmm. people have to actually replicate. And I don't yeah. mean the lights or the filter. I don't mean exactly. I just mean that to some extent you might like this or that or everything. Um, but it also made me realize, okay, if you're going to be switching out fish and escapes and trying to reach as many people, you got to do that with equipment as well. Yeah. The entire yeah. gallery, all the 120s are now run by 
um, hang on the back filters. And they have been for months. Before that, it was canisters. Before that, I, um, I had I built some sumps. Before That's that, it was manufactured sumps. I'm going to go into internal filters and sponge filters with them eventually, if it makes it that far, because I do have other plans. And uh, But, you know, it, it, it's interesting to... And, and I love the podcast because I now I can talk about this stuff. Now yeah. I can actually say it out loud. Mm-hmm. And because a lot of people are like, oh, he just switches his fish. Con-. That's been the plan. Mm-hmm. Right. Or Joey has all this expensive equipment. No, I don't. Go look at it. Like actually look at everything it. Everything you can do. This oh, is those backgrounds are, th- mm-hmm. those backgrounds are expensive. Um, and Joey, you know, we can't get that. Well, then don't. I got them for free. I, nobody paid me anything. I just think they're super cool, super realistic. And what you're telling me if that company of aquadecorebackgrounds.com mentioned or contacts you, you're going to be like, nope, I don't want one unless, you know, <laughs> unless <laughs> like you're going to want else one. can have one for free. Yeah. yeah if it, if it, the downside is, is you got to try to escape according to those backgrounds. And that mm-hmm. could be somewhat limiting to an extent. Yeah. Um, but if you're new in the hobby and you want something incredibly unique and that sort of thing, those backgrounds are a really good idea. But if you're like a master aquascaper, you probably don't want them. Oh. They're too difficult to work with in terms of matching everything to them and making it all make sense. Um, basically, instead of coming off of inspiration or what a fish wants and what you think the fish needs, you're now scaping based off of what the background. And have, when yeah. you're scaping and starting a new tank, it's best to start with a blank slate as opposed to. But you have a ton of aquariums, Alex. In a very small amount of space. I think you said you live in an apartment with 65 square meters. I don't know what that yeah. translates to, but it, I think it's like 200 square feet. It's, no, no, it's more than that. It's 700 square feet. It's a, it's, okay. a, it's a totally reasonable size apartment. But, you know, 20% of it at some points was covered in aquariums. I mean, it was – I I was like, I, I have such great skin. You know, I never have dry skin. I'm like, it's because the humidity in my house is through the roof. <laughs> Maybe that's, that's why. why I'm not aging that fast. Well, I'm aging. <laughs> and yeah, I, it's now I'm, I just have the 150 behind me and I've got a couple of other small things that don't have fish in them. They just have shrimp. Um, and I'm trying to decide, like, do I want to get more fish tanks or do I want to pivot towards a different approach? Because my, my core is science communication and I I would love to talk more about the, the biotopes that you and Rachel talked about of, you know, actually going to those locations and filming those fish. But that'd be cool. You know, I go with you. I, have it. you, have you been to, to Brazil? Have you, I mean, you know, project Piaba, have you gone and considered doing anything like that? I've considered it. Yeah. I mean, I've considered it. I just don't want to promote, um, like people get mad at me if I didn't take fish home with me. Uh, hmm. I think it's more important that places like Project Piaba ex- export than the common hobbyists go down there and handpick their fish, like if they're trophies or something. Like Absolutely. I got this. Yeah, I, I hate that idea. Of that and um, the other thing is like I would go down there and I would actually be in the water. I would actually be looking at their their, and I would probably bring materials to build the fish. I did that in Cuba. That video mm-hmm. didn't do well. Maybe I need to refilm or re-edit it. But that was probably one of my favorite videos where I built an yeah. aquarium on my, on my balcony took it to the beach and scaped it i caught fish in a water bottle using some bread yeah um <laughs> i took all of my knowledge and dumped it into one video type of thing like mm-hmm. the do-it-yourself aspect the the vlogging um the natural aspect showing things and that was a super fun video for me i'd love to do stuff like that again yeah. i i mean i yes 100 percent. like for me two two stories on this is there's a stream by my house. You know, it's maybe a half mile away from my house. Mm-hmm. And one of my favorite things to do is to put on a snorkel and stick my yeah. face in the stream. And it's, you know, not the cleanest place. And I always You're, not, you're also people, not small. You're a big boy. No, I'm, I'm like, six, You're quite tall. So I'm it must four. look ridiculous to see a grown man <laughs> laying down Just in the stream lay, with a lay, snorkel lay, on. <laughs> and, and like the water is like six inches deep. <laughs> yeah, um, that's exactly how I'm picturing it. That's exa- and, and like there's a bike trail that people walk by and they're like, is there a dead body in that stream? But <laughs> yeah. it, is, it is one of my favorite things. And I tr- constantly am asking people to come out with me because mm. if, you, I do it. if you see – life in a stream in your backyard you think like oh that's a stream there's not much there the second you stick your head in it you're like oh my gosh there's there's so much life and then Mm -hmm. you care about it um Mm -hmm. and the same thing with project piaba when i went down there seeing the ecosystems um i previously was like i really want to do species specific fish because or tanks um i don't want to mix too many things 
And then when I stuck my head in the streams down there, I was like, there are dozens of species of fish everywhere. I mean, dozens, 30, 40 species of tetras yeah. in this one mm -hmm. place. And it completely changed how I think about a community tank and how I think about how an aquarium works. And I think if, if you have not had the opportunity to go down to the Amazon, like going down there and seeing what those ecosystems look like will fundamentally change how you think about aquariums. Because until you see the animal in the wild, you don't really get what what you're doing. You don't get the ecosystem that you're trying to create and the specific behaviors that you're trying to to emulate to make those fish happy and and behave exactly how they would want in the wild. I don't mm. really love looking at an individual like that's why I don't like keeping big fish. And I know that you have kept a bunch of big fish, is because the fish is pretty, but what's cool is the behavior, and you mm. don't get that unless you have the species. Um, that it interacts with, and you don't get that that's unless a huge, you have numbers. There's a huge motivation to switch the 2000 over to a community tank. I love it. I love that giant community tank where you've got yeah, all the fish. It's I mean, super it's, interesting. It really I probably ruined it with the barbs and the denies and barbs and whatnot, but, um, and probably the archers because now it's no longer like a biotype. But um, Yeah, you're kind of crossing continents on that one, yeah, aren't you? Yeah, definitely. Where the tiger bear was from, like Sumatra or something like that, or I forget how to pronounce it, Borneo, like something like that. Yeah. Um, the archers are from East Asia as well. I mean, and then I have South America. What else is in there? Yeah, but it's but it's so it's. Do you, you en do you enjoy seeing the big schools of fish? I mean, you've got a bunch of fish, but you still have relatively large fish. You've got you know three or four yeah. inch fish. That's large for me. The biggest fish uh, I have is no. three inches. Oh. I got fish that are two feet long. I got like micro tiny little apistos now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a little bit of everything. And 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 over the past four years, I don't know how many species of fish have passed through the gallery or how many yeah. thousands we've had in total. But um, I miss some of them now, and I wish you know we could have kept them and whatnot. And I, you know, uh, I let YouTube kind of run everything a little too much and be a little too hands on. But um, you know, uh, I don't know, saltwater tanks fun too though. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. And I think I think that probably inspired a lot of people to get into salt. Mm -hmm. One of our guests next is a saltwater person. I think you're gonna like talking to as well. I've never. I mean, I did salt when I was in high school. Never. It was more work than it was worth for me. I mean, the fish are beautiful. One hundred percent, the fish are beautiful. Um, but it's it's so expensive. It stressed me out. Like the, the the stress of every part of it just stressed me out. Um, but you've i mean you've kept salt water um and that's not where you started uh mm. do you you but clearly you like it i guess that's the question like as a, I as like a freshman it. I person, love it. it's hard I for like me to it be like it a lot but I, i'm not that passionate about it and if i had to pick one or the other i'd go fresh water every time mm -hmm. yeah i think that's uh, people are one or the other i don't think there are a lot of people that enjoy both equally yeah. i think if if salt the, water tank is largely because people wanted me to keep salt and, yeah. and and I did it a few times on my channel, and there just wasn't interest, and then I lost interest, and yeah. um, stick to what I love. And mm -hmm. then now the 375 salt, and it's turning into a reef, and well, I don't know. We'll see what happens. My favorite version of the 375 was when it was the moss tank with all yeah, that manzanita that very, and very the uh, rainbows in it. That was mm -hmm. gorgeous. That was cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's exactly like the, what did you have, 150, 200 rainbows in there? Some crazy like number? That, yeah. I yeah. mean... If if I were stocking your two thousand, I would be putting a thousand rummy nose tetras in there because they're That'd such be tight schoolers, and you would just. I mean, the archer fish is what's screwing up the stocking because I want to have a thousand little tetras in there, but I can't because they eat them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I That's thought nice. they were gonna. I thought they were gonna be surface skimmers, and but they're you know they're predators, and yeah. Yeah. they were small, and I figured yeah they can't eat them. Yeah, they did. They <laughs> did. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. is what it is. But I, one, I, one time I, I had a, my 75, I had a couple of rainbows in there. And rainbows are lovely little fish. And you just, you know, this big. And I put in 50 neon tetras. And it, I've never seen a more horrifying bloodbath. Because, you know, that's 100, 150 bucks of fish. Also, I'm responsible for dumping all these fish in there. And I just watched yeah. just a feeding frenzy. It's like, I, I didn't think your mouse were big enough for that. What, and, and there's nothing I can do. Well, I'm good. just watching. This isn't going to video. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
hit the record button to stop it. <laughs> <laughs> you could try to save them, but there's like it's no, there's be impossible to catch yeah. them. And that, that was back in twenty fourteen or something. That was a while ago, and I've, yeah. I've definitely learned that lesson of if you think there's any chance the thing can fit in someone's mouth, do not mix them. Any yeah. chance? <laughs> um, yeah. I thought, oh, this, these are both peaceful fish. This will be fine. And it would have been had they been adult neons, but they were like, you know, three quarter inch neons. And it was awful. It was a nightmare. <laughs> but you're right. Yes. Had I been filming, I would have been like, this is going to go in the archive. I don't think this needs to go anywhere. <laughs> I'll save it and keep it to prove what actually happened. Yeah. But yeah. If anyone's it, ever wondering. In, in five years. Whatever happened people... to that tank, Alex? Oh, you know, just, you know. Anyways, what do you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. In five years, I'll be like, well, let me tell you the horror story that I definitely would never make that mistake again. But yeah. to publish it on There's the There's a time limit like, in which you <laughs> start telling the what really happened we'll get gary on this podcast eventually because when he st started filming with me a few years ago and then we'd make a video he'd watch the edited version and he'd always be like that's not what happened i'm like gary it has to be edited a little bit and to narrate the story a little mm -hmm. differently he's like mm -hmm. oh okay well it's like be a shame uh, well, if anybody found there. out <laughs> <laughs> yeah but, absolutely uh, yeah well, anyways, Alex, thanks for joining us of here uh, on another episode of Aquariums Unfiltered. Hope you had a good time. If you want to shout out your links and how everybody's going to find you, uh, please yeah, do so. Yeah, I will do that. So my uh, my YouTube channel is Tank Tested. I'm on Tank Tested on Instagram as well. Pretty easy to find. Um, I have I have an, uh, TikTok as well, but don't don't go there. It's just TikTok? me drawing pictures yeah. of fish. Well, I'm proud we got through this without talking about OnlyFans because that was a huge conversation between George and us <laughs> about getting on OnlyFans. Gosh, like, is, I am glad that I wasn't that a part mean? of that conversation. I would have been <laughs> yeah. so uncomfortable. <laughs> just biting nails. In the yeah, I don't just like, I, yeah. I, yeah. Well, whoops, my connection must have. Yeah. <laughs> Hilarious. I, I'm, I'm very, uh, you know, easily embarrassed and prudish. What am I going to do with that information? <laughs> no, you actually do really well with certain conversations. I mean, we just dove into for like 20 minutes talking about you coming out. You did really well. I think once you start talking about it and once you normalize the conversation, then it's easier to talk about it, uh, yeah. certain things. Unless Alex is a really good actor and I'm going to get a message later that says, delete this, delete that. <laughs> Delete the other thing, which he's entitled to, or if no, he doesn't like the entire I, episode, it's not. I think influence. you can publish everything in it. I don't think I said anything that's terribly embarrassing. Oh, there's a few things, but we'll leave them in. <laughs> Those are the clickbait. T no, <laughs> I'll just never rewatch this. That way, I'll never yeah. know what horrible, embarrassing thing I. I don't rewatch any of my interviews either because they're always cringe to me. Mm. Yeah, like on other people's channel, I was like, oh, okay, it's nice. I'll look at the comments a little bit, then I'm like, that's enough. I don't want to. <laughs> Bye. Yeah, yeah that sucked, but. But all right, man. Hey, thanks for coming on, Alex. I'm sure that we'll have far more to talk about in the future and we'll uh, touch base again. The first 10 guests are probably going to be like, first 10 to 20 guests will probably be like core guests where they'll mm -hmm. be repeat visitors to the show and get them on over and over again because odds are uh, it'll be the most interesting conversations and yeah. fun. But. Well, at some point you'll have to have me on and I'll have a nice prepared list of questions that are not questions that have you been asked of you before so or topics I, can, like... I mean anything we could discuss or go yeah, over no. maybe we'll yeah. deep dive deep into biotypes or and biotopes or whatever the case might be i mean there's so much to talk about and, and i can't keep you here for four hours and i gotta use the bathroom <laughs> and, you know um tamara has ibs so oh my god <laughs> <laughs> no i don't <laughs> But yeah, I mean, um, yeah, every episode is not going to be, you know, deep diving. But, you know, again, first 10, 20 episodes are just pretty much introductions into some of my friends. And, yeah. you know, we'll go from there. I mean, I've invested and I'm not going anywhere. I still like the podcast. So see what happens. But again, Alex, once again, of I'm course. Keep, keep this is the longest outro ever. I don't really have one. But uh, that was another episode of Aquariums Unfiltered. My fellow tank mates, thank you for joining me. And by the way, I will be getting a little uh, chair here because I, I joked about it a few times where I don't know if those episodes are out where I need to have like a little empty chair right here so they feel like they're sitting there. And it's just, I just thought it'd be funny. But anyways, Alex, we'll see you again shortly. It was a pleasure. Bye. Bye.